Hey guys, no PPMs in this video, just something much more controversial, audio amplifiers. I'm repairing an old audio amplifier that I built many years ago. Um, we're gonna diagnose the root cause of the problem and then try to measure its excellent distortion performance. Um, and to do that, we're gonna try and use a signal analyzer, but eventually end up using an external sound card and a great piece of software called Room Equalizer. Hope you enjoy. Now this is a design by Nelson Pass, who's a bit of a legend, and it's a kit amplifier that you can buy from DIYAudioStore.com. Um, it's something I built many years ago with a friend. We both built one each. Um, this is his amplifier. It's actually blown up, and that's the description I've got for it so far. These amplifiers are brilliant. You know, they're, they're absolutely amazing in terms of distortion performance, and uh, it's really quite nice how they achieve that but they are class A, so that means they produce an awful lot of heat. So what you can see on the side here is the enormous heat sinks for each side, each channel of this two-channel amplifier. They're very simple. There's very little inside them um, in terms of complexity. There's literally just two channels, one on either side. Most of this chassis is the power, um, and that's just a straightforward full bridge rectifier into some capacitors. What we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up take a look inside, see if we can figure out what's gone wrong and then repair it. And then what we're gonna try and do is build some audio analyzers so we can do a full checkup on this and see if we can measure that amazing distortion performance. All right, let's get the top of the case off. So looking at this amplifier, uh, what you have is the mains comes in, then it comes down to this board here. This board down here is a soft start board. So it's, its purpose is to actually switch in and out some resistance to actually lower the rush of current that comes in when this, this uh, transformer first starts up. And then after some short amount of time, this resistance is switched out because of course it's just um, loss of power, right? There, there's nothing beneficial about having this in place all the time. With the inrush protection uh, passed, you come into the transformer. This gives you um, two secondary windings. Um, I can't remember what the voltages are on. We'll say 20 volts, right? So you actually use those two secondary uh, voltages sorry, secondary windings are rectified over here and then they come through. So this is a connection with the transformer, rectified, come through onto this board. And what you actually have here is an RC filter. So you have your capacitors down here, kind of zip tied onto the board. Um, and you have some resistance up here that is just designed to help you filter out the mains uh, hum. Um, and then once you've done that, that rail splits and goes to each uh, channel that's on either side of the chassis. Those channels are actually fed via this line here, that's the input signal, and you can see it there for the other channel, and then they actually come out, the output from those comes out and goes into this board here. Now this board here is a speaker protect board, and what it's designed to do is detect if there is a DC voltage on the output of this uh, amplifier, and if so, it will actually cut cut the uh, connection to the speakers. And that's to protect the speakers. You don't want to put DC voltages over speakers because you just end up heating them and, and uh, straining them mechanically uh, to their limits. It's interesting though that you need this for this kind of amplifier because this is a DC to DC. This, is, this has absolutely no capacitors in the actual signal path, which is quite an achievement as well and it's part of the reason why it has such nice specs. Let's have a look at the actual channel. Uh, what you can see here is there's the two power devices here. So it's a push-pull configuration. I have a high and a low side um, uh, transistor. And those are uh, biased essentially by a resistor network. And there is some feedback here in terms of resistance feedback. Um, and then what you'll notice is the input stage is actually a pair of matched JFETs down here. So there's the pair of JFETs. Now it's those JFETs that are actually the, the magical ingredient for this whole amplifier. They, are, they were basically unobtainium, but due to the popularity of this amplifier, they actually started, uh, they, they were discontinued, but now they've actually been restarted again, you can buy them again. Um, yeah, but those are very expensive and uh, those are the hardest part of this whole amplifier to source. Everything else is relatively mundane. Okay, so now that we've seen the amplifier itself, what do we think is wrong with it? So here we're looking at the soft start board and um, what you can see is there's considerable burning underneath the resistors of this board. What might have happened? Well, clearly what's happened here is these resistors have not been switched out of the actual path. So the whole time this amplifier has been on, those resistors have been heating, have, have, have been dissipating power and heating the board underneath them until they've charred it. So they've actually reached quite a high temperature if you've started to char FR4. And so what I think we have here is a capacitive dropper um, followed by a, a full bridge rectifier made out of discrete diodes there. And then what we have is a 24 volt relay here 
that'll that'll switch on once this uh, capacitor charges up. So this capacitor provides a time delay. Um, but anyway, what you can see is when this thing switches on, this light comes on, but this relay never clicks on. So well, we can do that quickly. We can see that the LED lights up, but at no point does that click. And so, um, yeah, it, it's quite clear that this relay system has failed for some reason. So what we'll do is we'll get this board out and we'll start checking the components and see what the damage is. So yeah, here's the board and I think we can actually see quite clearly now the cracking on that resistor. That clearly has gone um, and, oh, that's terrible. Okay, so there's a real issue here. Um, there's a significant amount of carbonization here. So it's likely that this board might have become conductive between these two junctions now. So that would be another thing I'd like to check if this board is actually still safe to operate. You could argue that essentially even this section being resistive or, or starting to conduct because it's it's become carbon, if that's a real issue because generally this section's shorted out in normal operation. But yeah. Right, let's desolder these things and see where we are in a moment. These resistors desoldered and you can see this is just terrible damage. You can see the uh, trace is starting to lift here as well. Um, so I'm going to be very intrigued to find out what is the current resistance between these two sections. I believe they should be isolated um, the way they are right now. So let's measure that. So let's give this a go. So if we just check across these two terminals here, can we measure anything? No. Okay, that's, that's a bit more of a relief. It means that this board doesn't become entirely conductive. It's at least got mega ohms of resistance between those two points. So I can probably scrape this out a little bit, maybe even drill out the central piece. And then if I reinforce this trace as well, it should be okay to use this. Um, I would actually just, you know, rebuild the board and get a new one of these boards made, make it up for PCBWay, but my friend wants their amplifier back quickly. So, I mean, they use this every day. They use this all day, every day. So, yeah, we're going to fix some of the soldering as well and clean off all the flux. So what I did then was proceed to check things like the resistors, the resistance of the relay coil, the diodes for the full bridge rectifier, and all of that seemed okay. Um, I tried to do some capacitance measurements with this meter, but I wasn't getting the right reading in circuit. So I decided to desolder the large capacitor, but that turned out to be fine. So I then went for the dropper capacitor, and that's when I found that there was an, a real issue, actually, probably what the root cause of this problem was. So I desoldered these capacitors to take a closer look at them. Um, what you can see is there are two capacitors that have been soldered in parallel to combine the capacitance for them. So the two 330 nanofarad capacitors. Um, some interesting points there, X2 class capacitors. So these are designed for inline with mains, so they fail open. Um, and they're rated for 275 volts, and that's actually a bit of a red flag there. So I expect these together are to be rated at about 660 nanofarads notional, right? So we can actually check that with our, um, our LCR meter. So if we pop this in, then you can see we measure 226 nanofarads. So we're actually measuring about a third. And why might that be? Well, I think it's because of the voltage rating on here. So I, I have 275 volts rated on here, but that's just at the limits of what this thing needs to be. So it's likely what I think's probably happened is these capacitors have begun to open up, they've begun to fail, and so their capacitance has reduced until essentially this uh, capacitive dropper has been unable to provide sufficient current to close this relay. Um, and then this relay just hasn't uh, triggered open, uh, thus leaving these in circuit and then eventually leading to this kind of failure that you see here. So what I did was I ordered some replacement caps and I kind of figured it was this problem and I've ordered these one microfarad capacitors, again class X2. But I'm a little bit worried about this, this 310 volt rating, so it's higher than my 275, but I probably need something with a, a good deal more margin for error. Um, but what I'll do for now is I will install these 
um, and look at some calculations. So what you'll notice is the system here um, is a 220 ohm resistor, then a capacitor with a standard one mega ohm uh, resistor in line with it. You notice that they specify one microfarad here, and then they specify a voltage range from 250 to 400 volts. Now I think that 250 is for 120 volts, so in the US system, and this is actually probably the voltage range required for 240 volt countries like the UK. And um, then you'll notice that there's a rectifying diode. This is a full bridge, but it could also just be one diode. And then there is a 24 volt Zener diode there as part of the voltage regulation. So that, that caps this voltage here at 24 volts. And then we've got C10, which is this large thousand microfarad capacitor that charges up um, and gives you a delay before the voltage is high enough for this relay to switch on, which then actually engages or cuts out, sorry, these uh, resistors here, these inline resistors. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm using this uh, calculator online from nomad.ee, and it allows you to just kind of put in all of the details of your capacitive dropper and uh, look at things like the ripple on the current, but also the available nominal current. Now, what you notice is if I put 50 Hertz, 230 volts, a 24 volt Zener, and um, the 220 nanofarads that we were getting on our measured capacitor, so after it started to fail, uh, with a 220 ohm series resistor, what you notice is we're actually getting about a nominal current of about 10 milliamps to be able to be supplied by this, uh, this dropper system. Now, if I look at the data sheet for the relays that we're using, um, we have the 24 volt rated ones, so this is the one here, and you notice that the rated current is actually just 16 milliamps. So actually, if our supply has come, if our dropper capacitor has come down to 220 nanofarads, it's not able to supply the nominal current to trigger that relay. Um, if I had had 660 as planned, then what you notice is the nominal current that's available is 30 milliamps, so more than enough. What's interesting is though, they say um, minimum voltage rated for C1. So this is this inline capacitor, and they say that you need at least 460 volts rated for that. So um, double the actual mains voltage. So our 310 volts that we're using in this new capacitor is a bit low. Um, it's likely to not fail as quickly as the previous one did. I mean, the previous one actually failed over about seven years. So it's taken a long time to fail. Um, so we're probably okay, but I think I will get back and replace that capacitor at a later date. Um, I'll, go, I'll try and source something with about 400 or 500 volts of rating and put that in instead. Um, now the question remains is, was this an error on, on the builder's part or my part when I originally built this 10 years ago? Um, or, or is this something that we've maybe misread in the data sheet? Well, you can see the ratings here are kind of not spelled out, but there is a section on actually selecting capacitors for this. And what you notice is they have a 0.3 microfarad, 250 volt uh, rated uh, X-class capacitor here. And they say for 100 volts to 200 volts, 120 volts, you should use it between one microfarad and 0.68. Whereas you can be between 0.2 and one microfarad for, for larger mains voltages. So you'd imagine this fits into the 240 volts uh, AC. Um, so I'm not sure who this capacitor is for really. Anyway, they say, needless to say, the working voltage of C9 should be 250 volts AC minimum and types rated at 250 volts AC works well in this area. So there's no real guidance that for 240 volts, you should actually use about double the voltage rating. So that's something to watch out for if you build this uh, soft start board. Um, you really need to actually use something that's much higher rated if you want to play it safe. The amps back together, we're going to have to do some testing. And to do that, I'm going to use a beautiful piece of equipment here, which is a 35665A dynamic signal analyzer. And what this is, is it's a spectrum analyzer and a signal source. Um, and it allows you to kind of do swept sign measurements where you measure the frequency performance of op amps and so on. Now, despite the fact that this is a beautiful piece of HP test equipment, we're actually gonna see that it's pretty limited when it comes to measuring the distortion performance of this, um, of this amplifier. Now, the way it's wired up is I have one uh, output of the, sorry, the source output coming out from the analyzer is attached to the input here and I then tap that off again and put that back into channel one of the uh, of the signal analyzer. Channel two itself is connected directly across the output of the amplifier and I have actually attached two four ohm power resistors in series there to give me an eight ohm load and that's representative of my speakers. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a swept sign measurement here. I'm going to set the source level 
um, I'm going to turn on auto leveling and I'm going to set the level to uh, 1 volt RMS. That's going to be our target. Now with auto leveling on, I can actually choose what I want to be 1 volt and I'm going to choose channel 2 to be the 1 volt. So I'm essentially saying vary your source so that the output of the, of the amplifier is 1 volt. Once that's done, I can actually just hit start and the measurement begins. You can see that we get a fairly flat response from this amplifier all the way up to uh, 50 kilohertz here. But you can see, you know, the variation is between 14.4 and 14.355. Um, absolutely brilliant performance there. Next, what we're going to do is try and do a distortion measurement. So we're going to again choose the instrument mode and instead of doing a swept sign, we're going to do an FFT analysis. So we're going to turn the source on and we're going to set its level at something, yeah, okay, 0.135 and set that to be on. So if I place the source to give a one kilohertz sample, um, you can see I've put the marker about two kilohertz. So that's where you can see the first harmonic uh, of this system. Um, I've actually told this thing using the marker function modes to actually um, do harmonic markers. And actually I've asked it to compute the THD here. And what you notice is the THD is being reported down this corner and it's about point one percent at least according to this equipment but there's a question here am i measuring the noise of this amplifier or am i measuring the noise of the source here hi guys future marcus here i am just measuring the noise of the source i had looped it back inadvertently and was measuring port one instead of port two so yeah this uh, analyzer can only get down to about 0.01 percent thd that's actually its specification but if you look at the nelson pass uh, data sheet for the f5 amplifier you could see the specs actually a fair bit below that so we're gonna have to try something else so how we're going to measure the performance of that amplifier is using an external sound card um, now, the reason why I have chosen this uh, sound card is one, it's extremely cheap. It's uh, just, I think it cost me 10 or 15 pounds from eBay and it's external. So I, I have, there's less chance of me blowing up my computer um, when the whole thing is external to the system. It has some interesting abilities, like you can float the ground uh, on the inputs as well. That's all designed in. Um, but the big thing is this has an exceptional ADC and a very low noise front end. So what I've decided to do was take one of the outputs, so uh, in this case the right channel, the right channel comes out and then is fed back into channel 2. This is really just for leveling the input. And that then goes into the amplifier and then again I have actually tapped those 8 ohm resistors and they come straight back in to the channel 1. Now I've turned these dials here to these uh, set points that you see indicated. I found that these measurements give you the actual lowest uh, noise. So here's the Rumi key software. I'm just in the preferences setting up the sound card now. Probably the key measurements here uh, at the keyed setting is the sample rate at 192 kilohertz. Um, and as well as setting the inputs and outputs. So then the next stage is to actually calibrate the card. First thing you do is check the levels and you can see here the levels are just fine. I'm getting a good reading on both channels fed back from the uh, inside of the card. So I'm actually feeding the output of the uh, sound card back into both channels at this point just while I do a calibration. So then you can hit next and get a measurement and what it's doing here is a frequency sweep of the card trying to understand its bandwidth. Um, and then I can save that um, calibration by making a calibration file. And this is really important because the front end has a limited frequency response. It doesn't quite go down to zero hertz and doesn't quite go any higher than about 40 kilohertz. So I want to measure that so that I can then take that effect away while looking at my device under test. So you can see the, the response here and you can see there's a response that starts to tail off at about 40 hertz and about 50 to 60 kilohertz is where we start to see this. So it's really important that this has been measured because we can now then um, use that whenever we make other measurements. And one of those measurements we might make is a spectrum analysis. So this is just looking at the noise spectrum on the input of my device. And you can see we're over 130 decibels down here from the full scale measurement. So that's great. Lots of dynamic range in this system. So what I'm going to do then is instead of looking at the noise, I'm going to actually synthesize a, a signal at one kilohertz. And I'm going to use some of the options in here that are pretty nice, like locking the frequency to the real time analysis FFT and a little bit of dither as well. I'm going to uh, do that to basically get a very low noise and um, very low distortion signal uh, out. So that's the noise floor that you can see there. And I'm just about to turn the signal on. 
And what you'll notice is there's a bit of a broad peak at first as we go through the transition of the thing turning on, but then pretty soon it settles down and I can reset the averaging. So up in the upper left hand corner, you actually see the distortion measurements and you can see at the moment I'm getting 0 0.0046. Now that's, that's pretty low by anyone's standards, but it's not low enough really for what I'm doing at the moment. Um, and fortunately, part of the reason why I'm getting that uh, poor reading is because I'm not using the full output of uh, a full dynamic range of my DAC. So what I'm going to do is just quickly change the output here from minus 12 dB full scale up to zero uh, dB full scale. And that actually brings me down into the three zeros uh, range. So you can see now I'm getting 0 0.0095%. And that, that's low enough to actually test the specifications of the amplifier that I have. So I'm pretty happy. I'm going to now swap over to actually measuring the amplifier's performance. So I'm just going to remove the plug from um, from itself and then put that into the input of the amplifier and put the output of the amplifier into the input of the sound card. Um, you'll just see that happen here. So I get a lot of kind of noise of, of the changeover. So I'll have to just reset the averaging again. And now you can see the response of the amplifier. So now that first peak is much, much higher. I'm now seeing a THD of 0.006%, which is uh, with the specification. You see most of that's coming from the second harmonic. That's the fundamental there. The fundamental is much higher than it was before because it's been amplified. Um, you can see I'm getting some other peaks in here that are a little bit odd. I'm seeing this 30 hertz peak here. I'm not sure what that's coming from because the mains frequency, it, and there's a 60 hertz peak as well. But this 100 hertz peak makes sense because the mains frequency here in the UK is 50 hertz. So I seem to have a noise source of, of 30 hertz coming in somehow. So what do I think this is? Well, one of the things I tried to do was actually just um, measure the noise on the input of the amplifier. Now the input of the amplifier is high impedance. So really all I'm measuring there is noise from ground loops. And it seems that this seems to be um, an issue with the grounding or noise on the ground of my sound card. So I don't think I'm going to be able to do anything about this without building a better front end. And you can do that. There are lots of um, uh, nice, well, there's one particularly nice description of a front end for sound cards for doing this kind of audio analysis. But you know what, that's a little bit beyond the spec here of, of what I'm going to do. So I'm pretty happy with my performance. It's about 0.006%. I've not been very precise here in defining, you know, uh, my, what wattage I'm actually getting out of this amplifier. I'm just kind of doing a rough test here, but yeah, overall pretty happy. So what I'm going to do is try and do a sweep of the performance of the amplifier over a range of frequencies just to see if there's any kind of red flags in there or if, um, you know, if I've got any limited frequency response for this whole, this whole uh, amplifier. Um, so I'll go back to this measurement system, run a level check, and then actually do a sweep. I'm going to use some of the other options that are in the system, like uh, repetitions as well, to just kind of improve the amount of repetitions. I'm going to fix the, um, the, the full scale level here to 0 dB to make sure I get the best, um, best uh, low distortion input signal I can get. And then I'm going to do one of these runs. And what you see is I get an almost completely flat frequency response here. So you can see I'm getting a flat response even down to two or three hertz, despite the fact that my sound card can't measure that. Um, and that's because I'm using, you know, I'm waiting out the performance of the sound card in that in its limited response there. And you can see I was getting up to 100 kilohertz. Um, I think Mr. Pass says this, uh, this amplifier can get up to 500 kilohertz uh, flat response as well. Um, what I'm doing here now is actually getting the THD as a function of frequency, and you can see it comes up a little bit um, at this at this low frequency. But that might be because of the limited, you know, response of my sound card at low frequencies. Um, I'm getting about zero zero um, six uh, percent there, up to about four kilohertz, and then I seem to have some kind of bump at about eight kilohertz there. Um, you can see the noise floor as well. The noise floor is pretty pretty flat as well at, at a very low level. Um, and you can see that my THD is, is actually primarily composed of second harmonic. You can see it's almost the entire distortion is just second harmonic distortion, which is quite interesting. And, and it's interesting because um, Nelson Pass actually says that, that second harmonic distortion, if it has the right phase, can actually be quite pleasant. So... Um, and if you look at the design for the F5 Turbo, the more powerful successor to the F5 that I've built here, 
they actually add a potentiometer in to adjust the level of second harmonic. Um, so that, that could be something interesting to look at in the future. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. Um, there's a lot we could do in the future. For example, I could tune the F5 amplifier, change its bias currents, and actually maybe add that potentiometer to tune that second harmonic, try and get it as clean and as transparent as possible, basically get it down to zero distortion if that's possible. Um, but I don't think it's the lowest performing part of my audio chain anymore. Um, that's definitely my speakers. So probably what I'm gonna do in the future is look at building a, a full range uh, speaker set. So that's when you have a single cone producing all frequencies of the music. And that, um, well, that gives you some nice benefits in terms of interference patterns or not having them. Um, what I would do then is try and make that scientific by using calibrated microphones like this one here to measure the actual response of the room. And that might even lead me down the uh, never ending track of tweaking the room's performance using acoustic foam and stuff like this. But that's all for another video. So thanks for watching.